Hey everybody, Wes here, and we're going to take a minute to go into how this works and why it's called a cold blast lantern. Hey everybody, Wes here, and uh, here it is Sunday afternoon. I thought I'd just make this quick video. I found this beautiful, uh, excuse me, Dietz number 8 Air Pilot Lantern made in uh, Hong Kong um, the other day, or about a week ago. And uh, I mentioned that it was called a cold blast lantern. And when I did, I said, I might even make a video explaining what that was. Well, a couple of people said, hey, I'd like to know why it's called a cold blast lantern. So we're going to take a minute today and uh, I'm going to see if I can explain it to you. And uh, if you have any questions, be sure to send them to me. All right. So first off, let me say this. This isn't the best uh, video you're ever going to watch. I have a tripod, but I don't have a way. Whoop, drop my pencil to connect my phone to it at the moment. So. Uh, you're just going to have to bear with me. Secondly, um, there is a much more in-depth video online about the evolution of the oil lamp or oil lantern, just like this one. And um, it goes into a lot of detail um, about how the dead flame lantern came uh, along. A dead flame is kind of the, uh, the lamp you might see in your house. And then there was a hot blast lantern and then a cold blast lantern. Um, these are also called hurricane lamps and uh talk to you about that too so anyway hang on here we go okay everybody let's take a look at the lamp this is a hurricane lamp and the reason why it's called a hurricane lamp or more accurately a cold blast lamp is because it's relatively unaffected uh, by high winds uh, if we lit this right now we could set a big fan up right here and you'd see the flame move a little bit but it wouldn't go out uh, so hence the name hurricane lamps this particular one was made in Hong Kong, and because it's a Dietz, um, and it's a number eight air pilot, I know that these were made in Hong Kong after 1970, or starting in 1970, and they uh, stopped making them there in 1982. So this is somewhere was made somewhere between 70 and 82. Now before that, when they were still being made in New York, you could look right here on this, um, this tube, and uh, you could get a date code off of it. But well, when they went to Hong Kong, that didn't work anymore. Now, in order to operate these, of course, you put fuel in the bottom. Kerosene's a great fuel. Um, you pull this little lever down right here, which raises up the globe. You light the wick. Now, this one doesn't have a wick on it, but it's a flat 7 8 inch wide wick. Um, once you get the wick lit, you see if I can do this with one hand. Yeah, I can. You let the globe back down. And uh, you can adjust your wick height right here. And you have a nice uh, flame that is protected from the wind. Now, the question is, how does that work? And why is it called the cold blast? All right, so let's take a look at it. Okay, so what I've done is I've tilted the globe back and out of the way. This is spring-loaded. The globe fits right up against the bottom of that. Okay, so I just lifted it up, tilted the globe back so that we can see the burner. Now here's what I want to show you. We're going to take the fuel cap off so that you can see this as well. There we go. If you look down in here, and I don't know if you can really see it on this one, there's actually a space between the top of the fuel and the burner. So if you kind of imagine it out here, the fuel tank stops right here. And so you've got all this space for air between the actual top of the fuel tank and the burner, okay? So what happens with this design is that all the air for combustion is introduced right here at the wick. That's why they uh, burn so bright, okay? That they have a ton of oxygen coming in and you can see right here that it comes up through this grate pattern, all right? And then it's actually kept right next to that wick by this little piece right here. Now this piece is called the deflector. And that's just the little domed looking piece. Here, I'll turn around and show you real quick. See how it kind of has a dome shape to it? That the wick comes up through, okay? So after combustion theory was understood, what they realized was is they needed a lot more oxygen right at the point of combustion. So the way to do that is make all the air that this thing needs come straight up uh, right next to the wick and that's what they did in this design now as you have already guessed probably the air moved down these tubes and into this empty space 
and up right here at the wick. Now, you do see some holes on the bottom here. Those old holes do provide air, but not for combustion, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this back upright, all right? And you can just do it by lifting this up, okay? Spring loaded, like I said. And what this is, is the chimney, and that chimney is inside of a collar, all right? So if you were to look at it like this, you can see that the chimney runs up the middle and then you have this collar, which the tubes are attached to. So now you've probably already figured out how this thing works, but let's talk about it. Okay, so let's talk about these holes right here around the bottom. Those are not actually holes for air to come in for combustion. What happens is when you tilt this back up into position, these holes are so that air comes in. The burning wick creates an area of negative pressure and rising heat that draws in air from the outside. That air moves along the sides of the globe, helping to keep the globe cool. Okay, that way the glass doesn't break. So they come, those air streams come right up the side. They get to the top of the globe. When they get to the top of the globe, those air streams exit right out here. Okay. Exhaust does not exit out here. Well, some will. You can't stop it altogether. But um, the holes in the bottom and these holes here are strictly to set up air currents that go around the outside of the globe in order to help keep the globe cool. Okay. So now let me let me put this back up into position. That's going to take two hands, and we'll talk about the whole cycle. Okay. Got the globe swiveled back up and into place. And as you can see right here, this globe sits pretty well. There's a ridge on the globe that sits in a ridge on this chimney piece, okay? So let's think about what we've got going on. We've got oxygen coming in right at the wick. The wick is actually below this little dome piece that the wick comes up through. So it's actually concentrating all the oxygen right there to get the most combustion possible, all right? It does create an area of negative pressure as the heat goes up and out through the chimney. There are also some small holes on the bottom. Those small holes bring in cooler air. That cooler air goes right down the sides of the globe and then out these holes right here. The chimney itself is a tube that sits inside of a collar. So there's empty space all the way around it. As this thing burns, it actually, the air currents and the difference in pressure actually pulls cool air up into this collar. The air comes down these tubes and into the empty space just below where the wick is burning, okay? And then um, it delivers the oxygen. It does such a good job that it burns brighter than it normally would, okay? But the other thing is, is if you put a big fan up here, okay, it's not gonna blow the flame out. And the reason is, is because it doesn't get the air directly. It has to go up through this collar, has to come down around and into the bottom. And these tubes, all right, kind of act as a buffer. Uh, shock absorbers, if you will, to give the air time to cool or uh, slow down, not tumble as much, um, and those kinds of things, okay? So that's why it's called a cold blast lantern because it's actually cooler air. All the exhaust comes out here. So all your burnt, your CO2, your stuff like that, your combustion stuff comes out the top. Fresh air actually gets brought in through the collar down into this space and then delivered directly to the wick, which then, you know, makes this burn a little bit brighter because you're getting more complete combustion and protects it from wind. I got an idea. I want to show you something. Now, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but these burners are removable. If I remove this burner and you look down in here, you can see here's where the burner attaches and that is the top of the fuel tank. All this extra space all around it, okay, that's where the cool air gets brought in, all right? And um, all that oxygen gets delivered up through these tiny little holes. Does that make more sense? I hope so. There you have it, guys. That's how a hurricane lantern, a cool blast lantern, or cold blast lantern, works. 
Now, like I said, there's also dead flame lanterns, which are kind of like um, the oil lamps that you see on people's mantles. Uh, got the big tall glass chimney. There's something called a hot blast lantern. Also, Dietz made some of those. Dietz still makes lanterns, by the way. You can still get the number eight air pilot, brand new. Um, and then, of course, we have the cold blast lantern. I hope I did an okay job explaining it. I'm actually going to put a link in this video um, down in the uh, description that takes you to a video. It's about 30 or 40 minutes long, but it's a fantastic video uh, done by a gentleman um, that really goes into the whole development of oil lamps and lanterns and what and how they came along and why decisions were made. But anyway, hope that answers some questions, explains to you why a hurricane lantern such as this one is called a cold blast lantern. Talk to you later.